Susanna and Leslie have a combined teaching experience of more than 50 years of teaching and writing and have most recently worked together on the new Cambridge course, Guess What? So, over to you, Susanna. Hello, thank you, Charlotte. Oh, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, Steps to Su Successful Communication, which is all about enabling young learners to become effective speakers. We are Susanna Reid and Leslie Kustaf, and we're delighted to join you today and share some of our thoughts and tips on getting young learners to be successful communicators, and in particular, effective speakers. Okay, so why communication? It's a subject we feel passionate about and to start the webinar with an interactive quote to see if you agree. Communication, the human is the key to personal and career success. Do you agree or disagree with this? Type agree or disagree into the chat box. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Fairly clear. <laughs> so it seems as if all of us, I think, agree with this. Communication is a connection unique to us as human beings. The key to our success because it's at the core of everything we do. In our personal and social lives, we need to communicate to develop our own personalities and to relate to other people. And we need to communicate effectively to succeed in the wider world in our careers, or in the case of our young learners, in the academic context of being at school. So if we can give our young learners the gift of effective communication, we give them the key to a successful life. So how can we, okay, so how can we enable our young learners to become successful? We felt this visual of a staircase to success provided a good summary of our answer to this question with a clear and gradual step-by-step -step approach. And this is what we're going to explore in our webinar, how we can enable our young learners to progress up this staircase from red on their way to becoming effect speakers and communicators. We're going to do this by exploring five key questions and themes, which are, why do young learners need to communicate in the first place? What barriers might be preventing them from speaking effectively? How can we help our young learners overcome these barriers? Are our teaching methods any different for social or academic interaction? And finally, how can we get the balance right between accuracy and fluency when speaking? And we'll include here when and how we correct mistakes. We'll ask you a few questions along the way, and there'll also be more time for questions at the end of the webinar. So let's start with the most obvious question. Why do young learners need to communicate in the first place? And we'd like to ask this as an interactive question. Write what you think are the most important reasons in the chat box. Okay, if anyone wants to write a reason what the most uh, to say, to complain, that's interesting. Make friends, yeah, okay. Meaningful studies, share experiences and learn. Express their needs and feelings. If they would like to feel as an individual. Yeah, okay. To carry out functions. To interact successfully. Okay, lots of really nice ideas coming through here. Interact with the world. Yeah, lovely. Okay, share their own perceptions. Yeah, okay. What's what, what about without communication? Growing role of international spaces yeah okay so for your really interesting responses there we'll have a look now at how we've answered this question and we've done this with four points uh, which include many of the things that you've all mentioned as well our first um, point is that young learners need to communicate to develop their own personalities expressing our opinions is a way of expressing our individuality as we voice our ideas we also develop them and so we foster our powers for independent, creative, and critical thinking, 
and we therefore become more rounded individuals. Secondly, young learners need to communicate effectively to relate to other people in social contexts, the everyday communication of talking to other people as we go about our daily business. And social interaction, as you will mention, might be with people in our vicinity, our friends, family, teacher or neighbours, or in the modern world, it might be with people we communicate with over social media. Young learners also need to communicate to succeed in an academic context in their studies at school. And some of this language for this type of interaction will be different to the language they need in social contexts. It will be related to the school curriculum and include other content areas to English, such as maths, science and social studies. And finally, communication is one of the four 21st century skills skills needed for a successful life in our modern world, the others being collaboration, creativity and critical thinking. Speaking is clearly an integral part of communication, along with the other communicative skills of listening, reading and writing, and so it's an important part of the 21st century skill set. So if there are such good reasons why young learners need to be effective speakers, what might be holding them back? I will pass over to Leslie now, who will look at some of the barriers that young learners may face. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm just Leslie here, um, and just welcome and wonderful to see so many of you from all over the world. So, yes, there are some barriers that stop young learners from speaking effectively. So, what are these barriers? We are going to look at them and then we can think about how to minimize them. So as we go through these, I'd like you to think of your own classes and which of these apply or you have experienced, and then also how to minimize them. Okay, so the first barrier is not knowing the language to use. Some of these are language barriers as this one is, and if students don't know the language to use, they cannot communicate or be effective in their language skills in any way. They might not understand the vocabulary fully. They might not understand how to say something. The pronunciation could be challenging for them. And in other words, they cannot perform effectively. The next one is not having enough chances to use the language. I know that I can relate directly to this one as most of the classes that I have taught have been large classes. Um, Teacher-centered lessons are another reason students don't have a lot of time to talk. And numerous reading and writing assignments to, can decrease the amount of speaking opportunities as well. Another barrier is not having anything meaningful to say. So, if a lesson is meaningless or not interesting, students won't be motivated to talk about it at all. I mean, I can relate directly to this one because if you ask me to talk about boxing, I would say one word or two words, possibly a sentence, and that would be it. I'm not at all interested in boxing and it isn't meaningful to me. But if you get me talking about travel, well, that's different. I won't keep quiet. It's no different with our students. And the next one is an emotional barrier. And so there are language and emotional barriers. And this emotional barrier is not feeling safe or being afraid to speak in class. So you can imagine that if you're fearful of looking like a fool, you will be anxious and thus unable to perform well or be effective. So just as a recap, as you've seen, there are two types of barriers. There are language barriers and emotional barriers. And we think it's really important to think of both of these barriers as teachers in order to help our students to become effective speakers and communicators. So now we come to my, one of my absolute favorite things in teaching, and that is called the effective filter. I don't know if any of you have heard of this before, but I think it's a wonderful thing and learning about this really transformed my teaching. So what is this wonderful thing that I like so much called the effective filter? Well, oops. 
It is a theory that explains the negative and positive emotional fa factors that interfere with or enhance language learning. It's all about performance. The effective filter is really important. Um, I think it's an incredible part of lesson planning that we should all take, take into account because it has a huge impact on language skills, especially speaking skills where students are probably most vulnerable. And if we want our students to be confident and effective communicators, we need to enable them to have as low an effective uh, filter as possible. If the effective filter is low, performance and effectiveness are better than when it's high. So, let's look at some factors that lead to a high effective filter and thus decreased performance and effectiveness. The first one is anxiety. If students are feeling anxious or nervous in class, this will certainly interfere with their language learning and their language production. I'm sure if you think of your own experiences in life when you felt nervous or anxious, you can understand the impact it had on you. The next one is low self-esteem or lack of self-confidence. And if students aren't confident in their language abilities, their skills and therefore effectiveness will suffer. The next one is boredom or annoyance. If the students don't find the lesson meaningful, maybe it's not age or level appropriate, uh, they won't be motivated to use the language they learn in it. Or if the language level is too high and they can't keep up, they may check out or play up. Then classroom management can become a nightmare for us. I'm sure we've all been there. The next one is alienation. When students don't have good relationships with their teacher or their classmates, their language skills and effectiveness will suffer. If you think of a situation where you felt uncomfortable with the people around you, how did it affect you? So it's important for us to think of these things when we plan our lessons in a way that we can think, how can we help our students overcome barriers to effective speaking? Um, we need to provide help with both the language barriers and emotional barriers. And for the emotional barriers, we need to ensure that our students have as low an effective filter as possible, especially when they're developing their speaking skills, because it's at this time that they are probably the most self-conscious. So what can we do as teachers? So we're going to look at some tips, um, but first we'd like to ask you, could we ask you um, to type into the chat box, how do you build confidence in your students to speak in class? Or what do you do to enable your students to have a low effective filter in your classes? So if you could type some of your ideas in the chat box, that would be great. Yes, a lot of practice, they get confidence that way, give them equal chances, put them at ease first, wonderful, encouraging students, fantastic, not judging them, wonderful, speak in a friendly way, learner autonomy, establish a rapport, all of these are absolutely wonderful, icebreaker activities, excellent, effective teaching, fun, making them feel comfortable in speaking in class. Yes, absolutely terrific um, ideas, working in groups. Wonderful. So thank you for such interesting ideas. And Susanna will now have a look at some of the tips we'd like to share with you, some of which you'll see many of you have mentioned as well. So over to you, Susanna. OK, thank you, Leslie. Um, so first of all, our first tip was that um, it's really important to sure that we make our classroom a safe place to counteract the high effective filter caused by anxiety. Um, clearly, if children feel safe, then they're going to be more, more likely to want to speak. So one of the ways we can do this is by making speaking voluntary and being pushed into a situation where you're expected to speak and have nothing to say will only increase anxiety and lead to a high effective filter. 
So if students know that they only have to speak when they want to, they'll feel more calm and relaxed, and this will lead to a low effective filter, which then leads to a more successful outcome when they do speak. We will also reduce alienation if we can act as a mentor instead of a judge. We want our young learners to know that we're on their side and we want them to succeed rather than being ready to single them out and make them feel bad for their failures. If we focus on their successes, students can thus build a good self-image and confidence, contributing to a low effective filter. And correcting and dealing with mistakes in a sensitive way is an important part of this as I'm sure you're all aware. Students need to feel that it's okay to make some mistakes in any walk of life, and that when we correct them, we are doing so to help them and not judge them. And we'll look at some techniques for correcting mistakes at the end of the webinar. To make our students feel safe with each other, as well as with us, um, we need to foster a sense of collaboration rather than competition in the classroom. Collaboration is another 21st century life skill, and if we want our young learners to get on with other people in their lives and future careers, they have to be able to collaborate and work as part of a team. So we can develop collaborative skills with students working together in class, in projects, or on a piece of artwork, on a, as on this slide. And we can foster teamwork by encouraging them to recognize each other's different strengths. For example, working on a group project, one student might have the most ideas, but another is the best at drawing, and another has the neatest writing, but each of them have their own individual strengths to bring to the project. We can also encourage students to help each other to succeed in group tasks by assigning roles. For example, one student might be the let's all stay speaking in English monitor. <clears throat> We can also foster collaboration by including it as part of our curriculum um, in our social values teaching. This slide shows the teaching of the collaborative value of sharing in the context of a funny cartoon story. The story characters that you can see are going to a fancy dress party with their magical robot friend, iPal. But poor iPal is sad because he doesn't have a costume. So his friends help him out by sharing theirs. Winning the competition is less important than helping their friend. So young learners will enjoy the story, but they'll also pick up on the social value that sharing and collaborating with others is good. If we want to lower the high effective filter caused by boredom, clearly we have to motivate our students to want to speak in the first place. And we can do this, or the best way to do this probably, is with interesting lessons and by engaging them with age-appropriate topics that they will enjoy talking about in real life. As in this example, which is the first part of a lesson about wild animals. Here we're using a naturally motivating topic to exploit children's curiosity in the natural world around them. By using a bright and motivating fo photo, we focus their attention and engage them in the topic as we use the photo to bring the outside world into the classroom. And then by using a simple question, what do animals need, we're asking students to contribute their own ideas right from the beginning. This way we're motivating our young learners by making them feel that their contribution is valuable and important. And once we've motivated them to want to speak, we then have to build their confidence that they are able to do so even if their overall level of English is low. We can help them overcome any language barriers with carefully graded lessons. If we can make sure that students understand the language we're introducing, and of course the language they're expected to produce themselves, um, and we also need to give them very clear instructions so they also understand what they're supposed to be doing. And if they know if they always know that they have enough language to achieve a task effectively, they will be more confident to speak. And then higher confidence will lead to greater success, and that will then fuel further confidence and higher self-esteem. So for an example of this careful grading, let's look at the second part of the lesson about what animals need. Um, if you remember, we engaged 
students in the topic just with an eye-catching photo and question, but the second part of the lesson demonstrates how we can guide them to talk about the topic further using very careful staging and grading. Uh, we start at the top of the page just with the presentation of the new keywords they need, which here are water, food and shelter. Then the topic is explored further through a highly engaging but uh, a very simply scripted video, and we'll show you this later in the webinar. Students are then guided gently to speaking about the topics themselves, um, and they're helped with models given in example speech bubbles. And finally, um, there's a simple project which students might use as part of a show and tell session. And I think show and tell was one of the ideas that um, you, one of you brought up in the chat box. So we always want a clear and enjoyable path through our lessons like this with simple steps taking them from presentation to free practice. And always ensure that the language outcome is achievable so we can ensure success and build their confidence as a result. We can also affect the, uh, reduce the high effective filter caused by boredom and annoyance by using a wide variety of activities, as variety is the spice of life. And this is especially important and true for young learners who, as we all know, ha can have quite short attention spans. So we need to engage them with different activities and also allow a little bit of space for their own creativity along the way. Um, so the example I'm showing you on this slide is for a lesson revising counting and teaching some irregular plurals. And as you can see, it does this using a number of different activity types. Um, at the, the, first of all, there's an active counting chart, which also has a substitution element for increased student participation. Children can also act out the animals in the chant as well as counting them. You can then engage their own creativity by asking them to make up their own verse of the chant and draw their own group of animals to match. And then there's an observation activity which you can also make more fun by turning into a memory game or a true and false activity. And finally, there's an opportunity at the end of the lesson for an extension of the language into another context. Here, it would, might simply be looking for and counting things in their own classroom. So we saw earlier how one of the barriers to speaking effectively can be not having enough opportunity to do so. So clearly, it's important that we provide this opportunity in our classrooms, um, especially as students probably don't get much of a chance to speak English outside the classroom. One way to do this is to use the natural opportunities for speaking in the classroom. Um, and that would be just by conducting your classes in English and teaching classroom functions such as asking to borrow things or asking what things mean, taking turns. All of those things are examples of the natural opportunities of communication in the classroom. Another way to encourage it, as many of you mentioned in the chat box, is for to get students to work in pairs or groups. This maximizes speaking time because many students can talk at once. So let's have a look at some examples of different pair or group speaking activities that you might use. This first one um, is a simple spot the difference observation activities. And these make good speaking activities for pair work. Um, students simply find the differences and then they can use it as a communication activity by each testing the other. So, for example, one would find something and describe it um, from picture one, for example, a purple pen, and then the other says how this is different in picture two, for example, a purple pencil, or it's a purple pencil if you want them speaking in sentences. Guessing games are also very communicative. Here, one student chooses one of the children on the page, and the other has to guess who it is by the food they like asking, for example, does he or she like carrots? Or they can give and follow instructions in pairs. Um, this is an instructions game where students take turns to choose a racing car and be guided around the map by their partner. And then they could extend this into a similar activity around the classroom. Or small groups of children can just find out more about each other. 
These children are comparing their daily routines to find out how they are the same and different, practicing the present simple for routine and using so do I to agree. Okay, many of you also mentioned this, and this is something I think is really vital, that it's really important that we make the interaction in the classroom real and meaningful with personalised tasks, so that we allow students to really see communication. It's a genuine opportunity to express themselves and find out about others. If we can enable our students to personalise the language they're learning, they will see how to adapt it to their own lives and therefore they will take ownership of it. So thus, when they take their language skills into the real world outside the classroom, they won't then simply be regurgitating stock phrases from their English classes. They will be truly effective communicators, able to express and share their real opinions and views. And that's clearly a crucial thing. This health questionnaire is a good example of a personalised task. Students can use it to talk about their own lifestyles and find out how healthy they are by scoring their answers. And they're provided with a, a sort of summary at the bottom of the activity. This um, activity offers real communication as learners work in pairs and they won't know all the answers that their partner will give. But further than that, it could also be copied and taken home by children to ask their families the same questions. And this links, this would link class activities to communication that can occur outside the classroom. Okay, so let me just summarise then the ways that we've looked at here for lowering the effective filter and overcoming some of the barriers that children might face when speaking. We can... Um, we can reduce anxiety and boost confidence by making our classroom a safe place and we act as an encouraging mentor, not a judge. We foster collaboration rather than competition in our students so that there is a safe feeling among the peer group. We motivate our students to want to speak but we also support them and build their confidence with carefully graded lessons and language input. We reduce boredom with a wide variety of activities and we create lots of opportunities for speaking practice and we encourage true and meaningful expression with personalised tasks. Okay, so now let's look at the difference between social and academic interaction. Remember, by social interaction, we mean the language pupils need to relate to other people. And by academic interaction, we mean the language they need to succeed in their academic studies at school. So do these different types of interaction affect our teaching methods when we're enabling children to communicate and speak? What differences are there? Or are there any differences at all in enabling communication for a social or an academic context? And here, I'll hand you back to Leslie. OK, thanks, Susanna. Okay, so first of all, let's just think of some different social and academic interactions your young learners come across in class. Um, if you can think of some social interactions they might use, for example, asking for information like a name, and also academic interactions, for example, giving a short presentation, could you quickly note down some either social or academic interactions that you have used or use in your classes, if you could type those in the um, chat box. Uh, ordering a hamburger, very nice, makes me hungry, yes. Accomplishing a task while social is freestyle, uh -huh. greetings, yes. Debates, absolutely. Role plays, yep. Role play about banking issues, discussions. Thank you, please. Negotiations. They might write an essay. For academic, it's useful to learn a content. Yes, saying goodbye, negotiating, exam situation. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much for those. And we are going to show you some of ours, some of which you will see on here. So, for example, 
For social interactions, our classes might include making friends. Some of you said some of these, asking for things, asking for help, permission, at the shops, asking for directions. And some of the academic interactions might include anything that have to do with the cross-curricular content, science, social studies, etc., discussing a topic or presenting a project. So how are the methods? Oh, sorry, I'm just going to go back. Sorry. So as you can see, the language of these interactions is different. That is the one thing that is different. But for both the social and academic interactions, our methods mainly stay the same. That is the overall principle of providing varied content that's motivated, motivating, supportive, as well as fostering collaboration and self-development. And creating as low uh, an effective filter as we possibly can. So let's have a look at these two types of language skills. The first, for the social context, we use this thing that we now call BICS. I don't know how many of you have heard of this, but it is Basic Interpersonal Communication Skills, BICS. It's too much to say, so we just say BICS. And then there's CALP, which is Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency. So let's have a look at these in more detail. So of course, BICS um, is the conversational language we use in day-to-day -day social interactions. And language learners use these skills and pick them up very quickly when they're on the playground, at lunch, on the phone, and so on. Um, as we said before, it's social um, English. Many of the interactions we find in primary courses are BICS um, interactions. Students learning to say their names, how old they are, etc. And this is an example of using a story to teach some of the BICS functional language um, in the social context of playing together and taking turns. And this is in the context of a story. And I personally think stories are an excellent way of teaching BICS as they show the language in a context. A story is motivating and the speech bubbles clearly show who is speaking. Now, if you can read the speech bubble in, in um, frame three, you'll see this, that the story, among other things, clearly models the exchange. Can I have a turn, please? Yes, of course. So students will enjoy reading this cartoon story, we hope, we think so, as well as then acting it out. And the great thing about acting out is that when they act out, they learn and practice the, the functional language um, and turn taking as a natural part of exploiting the story. And the great thing about these very useful um, big social functions are that students can then apply that same functional language to a situation from their own lives. Here are two boys who are taking controls, uh, who are taking turns with the controls of the video game. Now, whether the boys are as nice as this in real life, I don't know, but let's pretend they are. And having practiced the functional exchange in the story, they'll be confident to apply this to this situation, as well as suggesting alternative scenarios of their own. And this is a big substitution activity that teaches students how to ask for and tell the time. So the inclusion of functional language in your lessons, um, this is including language, um, language targeted towards specific social interactions, such as how to ask for the time. These are really valuable for giving students confidence that they have the language tools to interact in real life situations outside the classroom. And confidence in speaking leads to success in speaking, which leads to motivation and a real love of learning English. And this is a very great thing because I'm sure, I know in my case, um, many of my primary students were not really interested in learning at all. Okay, and now we come to CALP. And CALP is the higher level of language skill we need to succeed academically. And I really believe that if we are to turn 
well-rounded students out into the world, we need to teach them both Bix and Kelp. However, the language skills for Kelp are more challenging to acquire than the language skills for Bix. If you think of your own language learning experiences, it's much easier to talk about what you're going to do tomorrow than it is to talk about politics. And this is certainly my case um, with Japanese. The thing I find interesting is that learners need much more time to develop the higher language skills needed for CALP. And researchers say that learners take two to three years to develop BICS, but they need between five and seven years to develop CALP. That shouldn't turn you off from including CALP in your curriculum. It's really important. And CALP skills, we know, can be harder for us to develop in class, especially when our learners have a very low level of English. However, we absolutely can do this if we choose academic topics of interest and structure the lessons in a way that makes them accessible and interesting and achievable. And we can do this even for low level students in grade one. So we're going to go back to this page that you saw before. Um, to see an example of how we can stage a lesson so that students can be successful in their CALP learning. So if we look at this academically, the academic subject here is the science of living things. It's the topic of what animals need for survival. And students are encouraged to think about this topic in terms of three things only. Food and water, these are both words they know from their general English lesson and shelter, which is a higher level, more academic word. They are being introduced to a single simple present verb, need, and the lesson is staged so they can talk about an academic context, uh, concept with three simple words. So students, um, so the desire to communicate about the academic to topic has been increased by the way it's been presented with motivating photos and then in a short dynamic video, which we're about to show you. Um, but with a gradual staging of the lesson, we, we aim for our students' ability to communicate to be helped. We'll play you an extract from the video now so you can see how this very simple staging of an academic topic can work. Charlotte, if you could key up the video. Come and see. Guess what? Come and play. Guess what? It's time to learn today. Guess what? Hello again. Welcome back to Guess What? Today, we are asking, what do animals need? Let's find out. Water. All animals need water. Look at these zebras. They've all got water. The cows got water too. Look at these small, they need water. The cats need water too. Food. All animals need food. Look at the elephant. It's got food. Look at the monkey. It's got food too. Look at the sheep. It needs food. Look at the small birds. They need food too. Shelter. All animals need shelter. Big animals need shelter. Look at the lion. It's got shelter. And the sheep have got shelter too. Small animals need shelter. Look, the frog's got shelter. 
The rabbits need shelter too. What do you know? What do animals need? They need water. They need food. They need shelter. Hi everyone, we're just having a couple of problems, so I'm just going. We're just going to have a brief pause, and um, we're just going to try and uh, sort out what the what's going on with this. So um, you might need to leave the session and rejoin. We're just going to try and do this now. Okay, so apologies about that, everyone. Um, for those of you who did see the video, as you'll have seen, um, the video is simple, but it's motivating. It motivates students to want to talk about an academic subject, buying it alive, but it's also highly supportive as it uses carefully graded language with simple sentences, and so it integrates the new content and language meaningfully. So then, when students come to discussing this academic topic in class, their motivation and their confidence will be high, as they are both interested and have a supportive model to work with. So we can achieve successful academic interaction, even at a very low level, as long as we approach it with very careful planning and grading. OK, so finally, um, we'd like to look at how we can get the balance right between accuracy and fluency when we're helping our young learners become effective speakers. How far are we trying to encourage accuracy when our young learners get all their grammar structures and vocabulary correct? Or do we aim for fluency where our learners speak easily and confidently and perhaps at a faster pace but they make a few mistakes as they go along. So we're going to, we wanted to start by asking, finding out which of these you think is more important for effective speaking, fluency, accuracy, or both. Um, and if there are still some participants who could type A, B, or C to give your answers, if you'd like to do that. OK, some people think fluency. One person thinks fluency, one thinks both. OK. So I would, we would probably say that, um, that both are important, really, for successful communication. If you want to be an effective speaker, you have to have a good balance between fluency and accuracy. Obviously, we want our young learners to be fluent enough to speak confidently and at a natural pace so that, it, that it's easy for, a listen, for the listener. And a certain level of mistakes or repetition is very normal in any conversation, even for native speakers. But, of course, they do have to be accurate enough to, for their meaning to be understood. There's no point speaking quickly and confidently if nobody can understand what you're saying. So getting this balance between accuracy and fluency does take time, but as teachers we can provide different types of tasks to practice both of these speaking skills in the classroom. Accuracy tasks are controlled because we're focusing here on using new language correctly. Fluency tasks are freer, obviously, because they are about speaking and communicating our opinions in the real world. So accuracy tasks will include repetition activities and drills or activities that use specific prompts or a script. And fluency tasks will include freer discussion and activities that involve improvisation rather than following a script. So sometimes a similar type of activity might be used for both accuracy and fluency, but it will just be handled in a different way. So, for example, you might get your students to repeat a story script in a way that's practicing accuracy if you're 
asking them to focus on the correct pronunciation and intonation. But if they're acting out the story from memory or using it in an improvised language of their own, that would be a fluency task. Whether a task is accuracy or fluency based will affect how we correct any mistakes that occur when students are doing it. And it can be really tricky to know when to correct young learners when they're speaking. We've spoken before about building their confidence and self-esteem, so we certainly don't want to squash this by jumping on every mistake they make. And it's also really important for children to learn that it's easy and natural to make mistakes, whatever they're learning to do. But equally, they have to learn to how to speak accurately enough for other people to understand. So when and how should we correct mistakes in speaking activities? OK, so drills are accuracy activities. So this is where to focus on errors. Correct mistakes early on and clearly in drill activities. And you would also want to correct mistakes when you're monitoring pair and group work activities in the, very, uh, in the early accuracy stages when you're just introducing the new language. But fluency, in contrast, is just that. It's about uninterrupted speaking. So if we interrupt fluency activities when the children are mid-flow, they will then become accuracy activities, and that will take the joy out of the task. Um, so don't interrupt. You know, We would want to avoid interrupting or stopping the flow of fluency activities. Rather, we can make a note of the mistakes our students commonly make as we walk around and monitor the activity. We allow the students to finish the activity and then we can go over and correct their mistakes. And, or if the same mistakes are coming up a lot, perhaps it's, that's a sign to plan a review lesson on a particular point. In fluency tasks, one way we can correct a mistake is perhaps with a mirrored correction so that we're not okaying a mistake but we are allowing um, we're allowing the students to hear the correct form. So for example, if a student says, I go to school yesterday, you can correct it by simply repeating the sentence in correct English. Oh, you went to school yesterday. So that way the student communication will not be interrupted, yet they will have heard the correct language. And in our experience, they will usually then just repeat the sentence in the correct way without being told to. So there's just three tips there for um, correcting mistakes in different ways. OK, so in summary, um, communication is the key to a successful life for our personal development, our social relationships, and in our academic studies or careers. And speaking plays a key role in communication. So to be effective speakers, students need language input lots of opportunities to use the language, plus something worth talking about. We've seen that they may experience emotional or language barriers that prevent them from speaking, but we can help them overcome these barriers by motivating them to speak and supporting them as they do so. And if we can do this, and therefore encourage them forwards on their path to becoming successful communicators, we will have given them the key to a successful life, which is at the heart of what we want to do. Okay, so that's the end of our presentation. Thank you for participating, and I apologise for all for the problems. Um, and now I'll hand over to our colleague Charlotte Christopherson again to field some of your questions. Hi, Susanna. Thank you um, again for continuing, and um, apologies to everyone for the um, for the issues with the sound. Um, I think due to the um, issues, we haven't actually been able to get everyone back into the webinar. So um, I'd have to ask perhaps um, people to field their questions uh, to me by email, perhaps, and then maybe we can pick these up at a later date. Is that okay with you, Susanna? Yes, that's fine. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I'm very sorry about uh, the issues for this. Um, we'll obviously pass the recording over to um, to everyone and get that up on our blog as soon as possible. Uh, so thank you very much, Susanna. I think we've lost Leslie, unfortunately, but thank you very much to you. No, no, well, very thank you. you know, I'm very happy to, some of the questions are really interesting, actually, so I'm very happy to reply to anything personally, if you like. 
So, yeah. Okay, great. Then we'll we okay. hopefully be able to, to organise that. Excellent. Thank you very much, Susanna. Thank you very much.